Today I'm going to talk about Shakespeare's influence on the Marvel Cinematic Universe, specifically in Thor from 2011. Today's video is actually taken from a lesson I taught my students not too long ago, and I really enjoyed teaching it and the students really enjoyed learning it, and I figured everyone else might enjoy it as well. So I hope you stick around and learn something today. Thor was directed by Kenneth Branagh. Now Branagh is a renowned Shakespearean. His entire career, both in film and on the stage, has mostly revolved around Shakespeare's works. Uh, notably, Henry V, in which he plays uh, King Henry, and delivers the St. Crispin's Day speech, which I have shown my students multiple times, probably to their great annoyance. Don't worry, it's good for them. Now, in order to explain how Branagh allowed Shakespeare to infiltrate his version of the Thor legend, first we'll need to look at some of the main characters. There are three main characters we'll be talking about today, with a fourth bonus character. The first character we'll talk about is Odin Allfather. In my, inter in my interpretation, Branagh allowed Odin to represent King Henry IV. Now, if you've read King Henry IV Part I, uh, we learn that Henry IV is an older king. Uh, he has a son named Prince Hal, which we'll be referring to uh, Henry V as Prince Hal for the remainder of this video. Uh, Prince Hal was an unruly child. He liked to drink. He liked to party. He was not the image of a prince that his father had planned for him, and Henry IV genuinely worried about how the transition of power would go when it was time for Prince Hal to become king. Now we'll talk about Thor. Like I've mentioned, uh, Prince Hal, that is exactly who Thor was modeled after in this movie. When we first meet Thor, he's cocky, he's arrogant, he's full of himself, he is entitled, and he thinks he's right about everything. In the film, which is somewhat different from the uh, original play, Odin actually has to banish Thor to Earth to teach him humility. While this does not necessarily happen in the play, it is clear that there is uh, quite a bit of irritation on the part of Henry IV in regards to his son. I believe that the scene in Branagh's uh, film adaptation expertly displays this agitation and takes a step further with the banishment, which we'll check out here. You hope to protect the kingdom, get into the healing room. No! There won't be a kingdom to protect if you're afraid to act. The Jotuns must learn to fear me, just as they once feared you. That's pride and vanity talking, not leadership. You've forgotten everything I taught you. But a warrior's patience. While you wait and be patient, the nine realms laugh at us. The old ways are done, you'd stand giving speeches while Asgard falls. You are a vain, greedy, cruel boy! And you are an old man and a fool! Yes. I was a fool. To think you were ready. Father. Hey! Thor, Odin's son, you have betrayed the express command of your king. Through your arrogance and stupidity, you have opened these peaceful realms and innocent lives to the horror and desolation of war! <laughs> Unworthy of these realms, unworthy of your title! You're unworthy of the loved ones you have betrayed. I now take from you your power in the name of my father. Whosoever holds this hammer, if he be worthy, shall possess the power of Thor. Now, in the play. Prince Hal is offered a chance of redemption when he has to take down the rebel tyrant Hotspur. Now this is particularly interesting because in the film version, before Thor can return to Asgard and return with his powers that have been stripped of him, he has to face the Destroyer, which is sort of a sentry bot sent down from Asgard by Loki 
to make sure Thor can't come back to save the day. What I find particularly interesting is that in the movie adaptation, the Destroyer is a giant robot that bursts out beams of fire at its enemies. Now bear in mind the enemy in Henry IV Part One is named Hotspur. And in the film, the enemy is a giant robot that blasts fire. I find that the, uh, the pun here is actually is really good. Branagh has effectively put Hotspur in the Thor movie as the Destroyer by giving the Destroyer the ability to breathe fire. Hotspur, heat, fire. It took me a minute to figure that one out, but I really appreciate that pun. Third character we'll talk about is Loki. Now this is probably the most interesting part of this uh, discussion. I believe that instead of being a character in King Henry IV Part One, Loki is a star of his own show entirely, which is actually rather fitting, and that show would be King Richard III. Now, Richard III is your stereotypical villain. He wants to be king, but he cannot be king, so now he sets out to make that happen for himself. I'll show you a clip of the opening monologue in which Sir Ian McKellen plays Richard III, and we'll discuss what we see after that. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this son of York. <laughs> and all the clouds that flowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean, buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths. <laughs> our bruised arms hung up for monuments. Our stern alarms changed to merry meetings. Our dreadful marches to delightful measures. <laughs> Grim-visaged war has smoothed his wrinkled front. And now, instead of mounting barbed steeds to fight the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a newt. But I that am not shaped for sportive tricks nor made to court an amorous looking glass. I that am rudely stamped, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world, scarce half made up. And that's so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I halt by me. Ah, in this weak piping time of peace, I don't like to pass away the time. Unless to spy my shadow in the sun and descant on my own deformity. I can smile and murder while I smile and wet my cheeks with artificial tears and frame my face to all occasions. And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover, I'm determined to prove a villain and hate the idle pleasures of these days. All right, we notice a couple of things right off the bat. First, we notice that Richard III is showering praise upon his brother, the Duke of York. The Duke of York has just been named king after a long and grueling war, and he is delivering a speech, giving his brother accolades, praising him. At the beginning of the first Thor movie, we see Loki doing similar things. He is Thor's best friend, he is his buddy, he's there for him, he has his back. But as the story progresses, we see that that's not exactly the case. Likewise, in this scene, when Richard enters the bathroom and no one can hear him, the dialogue changes a bit. No longer is he singing his brother's praises, he is now whining about how misshapen he is, and how no one can love him, and how he can't be king because... He's not physically fit. He even goes so far as to say, Therefore, since I cannot prove a lover, I am determined to prove a villain. Now let's pause there a moment. I want to show you a clip in which Loki learns that he is adopted. I'll show you that now. Oh. 
Stop! Am I cursed? No. What am I? You're my son. What more than that? The casket wasn't the only thing you took from Jotunheim that day, was it? No. In the aftermath of the battle, I went into the temple, and I found a baby. Small. For a giant's offspring, abandoned, suffering, left to die, Laufey's son. Laufey's son? Yes. Why? You were knee-deep in Jotun blood. Why would you take me? You were an innocent child. No. You took me for a purpose. What was it? Tell me! I thought we could unite our kingdoms one day, bring about an alliance, bring about a permanent peace through you. But those plans no longer matter. So I am no more than another stolen relic, locked up here until you might have use of me. Why'd you twist my words? You could have told me what I was from the beginning. Why didn't you? You're my son. I wanted only to protect you from the truth. What, because I, I, I'm the monster that parents tell their children about at night? No. You know, it all makes sense now why you favored Thor all these years. Because no matter how much you claim to love me, you could never have a frost giant sitting on the throne of Asgard. Okay, now we're back. Let's talk about the moment that Loki touches the casket. Odin enters and tells him to stop, and the first thing that Loki says is, Am I cursed? He turns around, and we see that his skin is blue. And it is in that moment that we realize that Loki is actually a frost giant. Touching the casket reveals that truth of him. Now, where it gets really interesting for me is this is where Loki and Richard III really get parallel. Whereas Richard III is whining about his uh, abnormalities, we can see that he has a paralyzed left arm, he walks with a limp, and he's a hunchback. In this scene, we see Loki has blue skin, and looks to be red eyes, and he is afraid of himself because he realizes he is a frost giant. Odin explains that he is still his son, merely adopted, and Loki takes umbrage to it, saying, I suppose now I am the monster that we tell children about at night. He's self-deprecating himself, very much like Richard III. He is complaining and making himself the victim. And then we see the anger come. Just as Richard III says, therefore, since I cannot prove a lover, I am determined to prove a villain, Loki responds in anger as well, saying, no matter how much you claim to love me, you can never have a frost giant sitting on the throne of Asgard. And that's where we see his real motivation. He wants to become king. Remember back to those clips. Look at all the times that Richard III and Loki said me or I. This is extremely important for one other reason, and it's a biblical reason. In the book of Exodus, Moses approaches the burning bush. He says, what are you? And the bush replies, I am that I am. And here we see Loki and Richard both using I, me, I, I, me, 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 over and over again. It's indicative of a god complex between these two. These two were villains because they want power that they are not supposed to have. They'll stop at nothing, and they don't care who they'll kill in order to be worshipped the way they want to be. It's an interesting little analysis. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and I hope I haven't bored you too much. If there's anything else that you'd like to see me analyze, whether it be the DCEU, MCU, video games, and connecting those to literary works, feel free to drop a line in the comments. 
I'll definitely get back into that, and I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.